Hey guys, this is Andrew with High Level Reviews, and today I'd like to discuss the first Grandia's convincing and expansive mythology, and why it is one of only a handful of games that truly understands the complexities of creating cogent mythologies and how to represent and incorporate them in a game's world. Myths and legends are important for numerous reasons. They're valuable as literature, as they offer ageless and universal themes that have been studied for years by the likes of Joseph Campbell, who popularized the idea of the hero's journey, Sir James George Fraser, and Robert Graves, just to name a notable few. They give us insight into the distant past and enable us to understand traditions and rituals specific to groups of people. Different cultures have their own mythology, often reflecting local geography, history, and values. Even various cultures within the same region can have vastly different sacred mythologies. When crafting a believable and complicated mythological system in a video game's world, this seems to be one of the more common oversights, uh, that there is a severe absence of various interpretations of the core myths, or that there aren't more idiosyncratic and culturally dependent takes on the world and a group's place within it. Uh, this helps to create a unified and believable mythos. When a game has nearly every inhabitant of a world be aware of or understand a universal mythology, it ends up leaving the universe and the game feeling more like an extended town rather than a vast and tangled network of unique entities. To clarify, it's important to diversify the way in which different groups in a video game's world interact with the primary mythology, be it through slight alterations or additions or even subtractions. The beauty of Grandia's Icarian Legends is that they are various and diverse and each expand and add further nuance to the world. Each town, from Parm to Luke to Dight, have their own accents on the central mythology, often explaining large geographical structures, or leading Justin and his party to ruins to discover artifacts and murals left by ancient civilizations, or, mirroring our own modern world, adding an archaeological and historical perspective to the narrative. Many games, even the hallowed ones in the JRPG genre, often utilize myths and legends as plot points or pap and tired attempts at world building. Few make the effort game arts did in developing a deeper and connected world, all struggling to make sense of their own existence. They also took a single, world-altering event and displayed the inevitable interpretations and bastardizations of the fall of Angelou as they would organically occur. The level of planning and detail put into this game is astounding. Grandia's engaging fighting system that employed smart alterations to a very traditional base is well documented and ends up dominating the discussions about this game. Its soundtrack, composed by Noriyuki Oridari, is also just superb and emotionally jarring considering the often lighthearted tone of the game, until the second disc that is. Takishi Miyagi, the game's director and younger brother of game art CEO Yoichi Miyagi, stated in an interview shortly after Grandia's release that creating a living, breathing world was the slogan at Game Arts and Hidenobu Takahashi, the art director, stated in the same interview, If I had to sum up the fun of a game world, it wouldn't be just looking at it, but also interacting. No matter how realistic you depict your world, if the player isn't having fun in it, you failed. While Mayaji's work on the Lunar and Grandia series influenced and helped evolve the development of role-playing games, I find it near criminal that Grandia's mythological structure isn't discussed more often, and I hope that I'm simply unaware of its inclusion in some sort of video game design courses, though I kind of doubt it. With the deep roots of ancient mythology of all variants that many video games have made use of, and with science fiction's formative authors playing such an integral role, such as Larry Niven's books Ringworld and Known Space purportedly heavily influencing Bungie while creating the Halo series, and the obvious Lovecraftian designs of Bloodborne, and of the entire RPG genre to be fair, it's easy to see why deftly utilizing strong literary creations and myths pushes the medium forward. It's impressive to play through a game that, while obviously informed by already established literature, created its own world and didn't flippantly toss in half-hearted allusions to or inclusions of Greek or Norse mythological figures like so many other of its contemporaries did. I'm not suggesting that this, by nature, is a terrible or entirely lamentable practice, 
but it was far too prevalent and when not skillfully done, did little to enrich the game's story and history. There are many reasons to play through the first Grandia, but next time you do, make sure to stop and appreciate the effort game artists put into this game's mythology and world. It was an impressive feat.